now then? What should we start talking about? Containment. So just looking up my notes on holding. So just talking about, you know, conscious holding, requiring, empathizing, talking about kind of the concept of the bubble. If it's better to hold other things, like why aren't we doing that with everything? And the last kind of thing you talked about was getting back to that that black nightgown effect. Yeah, right. That's which is a different. It's a different thing, but I think it's 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 relevant in the the ramifications of holding. No doubt. And I think that's a fair or a good transition to containment, because like containment, it's necessary at a point for both people involved. It would seem. That the if you if you hold something that or if you try to hold something that neither of you can hold is that one reason containment would come in or is containment because you talk about on the website that containment is about uh, almost conscious coherence yeah you have all this energy and you're giving it a conscious you're allowing a structure to form within it via consciousness and that's containment is that accurate yeah and I. For a while, I didn't have the word containment in there when I was teaching this stuff because holding, when most people think of holding space, they also would say that that you're providing a container. But I experience holding and containment as two different actions. I always try to figure out a better word for like conscious actions or conscious activities or, con- you know, focuses or th- there's... yeah. But obviously, the way the way I've put it on there is that focusing conscious attention in these five different ways. So it's, I notice that it's I'm focusing differently when I'm containing versus when I'm holding. And so the way I'm using holding is that it's it's rather unbounded. There's an empathy, but it's not contextualizing. It's not setting limits. It's not organizing. An analogy would be like being present with someone while they brainstorm. You're in a holding where you're you're uh, saying, okay, I see maybe where you're going with this. But uh, the containment would be, okay, let's try to organize this a little bit. There's an energetic aspect to that and a conscious aspect to that where in the throes of, let's say, an emotional experience, empathy feels good, but there's a way that, that the empathy the various systems in our psyche need to feel into and bounce off the limits of a container. We regulate ourselves via feedback loops, physical feedback loops, emotional feedback loops, mental feedback loops. And so we all want to feel felt, which is what holding is. But we also want, we want what we're doing to hit something and we want that something to be solid just holding with no containment can just perpetuate anxiety because again the the energy can't sort of take shape it can't it can't be processed and understood and regulated without a container so again in the same way that, that any kind of art for example you know you can have abstract art you can have very free form stuff but it's like okay is there some kind of structure somewhere right in order to like with music, is it just, what's, what's the term? Cacophony or something like that? Cacophony. Cacophony. Or, or is there some kind of structure to it, you know? And containment, via, via a container, experience organizes into structure. But the act of, ener- of consciously containing, to me, it's, it's recognizing a dimension. There's a dimension to this experience and what that does right off the bat is it is it changes it from it being totalized, right? The very, the very nature of there being a container is it suggests that it's not the all. For certain types of experience, we fight against a container, right? Because we want it to be the all. However, we get out of control when we're in an experience where we're the all. <laughs> Anything you believe to be totally true is going to get you in trouble. Yes, exactly. Even though you and I use the word totally every third sentence in this podcast. But yes, it's... I held one back there. (laughs) So yeah, you know, narcissism, aggrandizement in child development, it's well known that if you don't contain a kid, if you don't put limits on them, if you don't set boundaries, the child feels out of control and and the child is given too much power, right? And a lot of 
I think a lot of parents, especially today's style of parenting, the child is given too much free reign. And, and there's something really important about a container, even though the container will often initially produce frustration, rage, disappointment in the person being contained. It's like our system, for example, the development through the chakras. We start off being our first chakra and trying to rule the universe with our first chakra. And hopefully the world, and hopefully mostly via our support figures, limits us, right? And provides boundary and provides containment. And we rage against that containment, right? We don't want to be controlled. However, that's what we need. And ideally that container isn't suffocating. Ideally the container isn't attacking, shaming, but also ideally the container isn't too weak and, and uh, easily broken through because that has a detrimental effect as much as a container that's too constrictive. So if you come with, with a container and no holding, then you're doing an uncompassionate limit setting, which would not be a conscious container, right? It would be a, just more of an ego container. So, for example, the phase of, of child development where ideally the parent does a dispassionate no, for example. Dispassionate doesn't mean not compassionate. It means not emotionally uh, aggressive, for example. The child being angry and throwing a tantrum and then the parent throwing a tantrum back <laughs> isn't really empathy, but you could say it's at least emotionally matching, right? But that's not what the child needs. The child needs to be felt and then provided a container as well. Right. So containment isn't instead of holding, it's in addition to these things build on each other. Right. So again, it, it's, it's not an exact science and there's always this overlap, but initially to provide holding if you take an argument between two people let's say initially when a person's in the you always or you never phase of the argument right it's like okay they're looking for some some empathy with that some empathy about their frustration some empathy about their disappointment or whatever and ideally they get some but then at a certain point it's like all right, but let's let's try to put that in some perspective. I I don't always do that, right? Right, right. <laughs> Should we bring Sky in to? Uh... Nope, not at this time. <laughs> Sky is Jeff's wife, by the way. If listeners haven't figured that out, and she knows everything I always do. <laughs> so again, that, that, a, a verbal container would be to say, okay, but not, you know, not always, just most of the time. Um, only, you know, only when you do this other jacked thing. But so again, wh whether there's any words or not, a person can show up and provide containment. So should we do it in experiential? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you free reign for a minute, Jeff. And then <laughs> I, I'll, don't, I don't know if we should do that. Then I'm, I'm going to contain your ass. It'd be better if you were maybe ranting about something or having an emotional breakdown. Yeah. Let me, let me find one. What's a topic that you feel passionate about besides the dimension approach? Right. Besides, besides what I'm contractually obligated to. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I can like just find the feeling of like being unjustly told that I'm, you know, wrong mm. or like, uh, like someone trying to, cut me off or like tell me that I don't understand or like, so I can find that feeling. Okay. And it's just like a, a whiteout. It's like, a a lot of heat to it. Okay. So what I'm intending to do is to go into an empathic holding and and just try to feel what you're feeling. Uh, 
Um, and I don't always work this way, but if I if I start putting some words to it, there, I don't know, a word that came was sharp. There's something mm. that feels sharp about the reaction. Yeah. Um, feels historic too. Like it's a, a pattern. Yeah. That it's like the anger of it feels white hot and yeah. therefore it's like you kind of afraid to touch into it. Just go into that, that kind of blank state. Cause you know, if you, if you don't stay in that open blank mind state, then you're going to, you're going to, it's like the RPMs are redlining. So you don't dare throw it in gear. Does that resonate? Yeah. Yeah, totally. <sighs> and so I'm saying words about it, but energetically, does, do you sense me uh, empathizing? Yeah, I mean, there's some relief just from feeling that and not feeling a... You're not reacting in the same way, but like you can feel like you see that that's how it feels. Okay. Yeah, it's not comfortable. Okay, so if we say that we're in a holding right now, and then if we're going to shift to containment, uh, the idea here is, okay, if I'm going to be able to be empathically in this with you, but then start to pr provide context, to start to provide a container that this can exist in. So before I even say words... Uh, can you tell that I've shifted what I'm doing? Yeah, there's more of a, it felt like I could, the vibration in me was like, like you said, just trying to maintain. And there's kind of an inward shift when you did that, that got a lot darker, a lot less white. Okay. So do you have the sense that your experience is happening within a particular space now as opposed to everywhere? I mean, that space might feel bigger than you, but can you tell that it's a space that isn't as big as the universe? I would say there, there's like a stability that wasn't there. Okay. So the, the sense of space at least like word wise for me, isn't like resonating, but there's a, a shift in, um, it's a little less psychotic, right? Psychotic meaning just chaotic, disorganized experience. Right. So there's starting to be some kind of, stability, some kind of organization. And, and a lot of times, you know, as far as the shift to containment and it having the effect on the psyche of, of organizing, what can be real hard is, for example, psychotic anger can shift from just that sort of tantrum -y experience up into what actually starts to feel more diabolical or more paranoid mm. or more organized. Like I've, uh, an example I use a lot is in the, in the Godfather movies, you know, you have these three brothers and they're these three different archetypes and, and, uh, Sonny, who's the character played by James Kahn. He's just this loose cannon and, you know, gets triggered really easy and then just flies into 
violent rages. And so initially it seems like he's, he's the, the quote unquote bad brother. Right. And then you've got Fredo, who's the opposite. He can't, he can't engage and, and harness his aggression at all. So he's the, the weak one. And Michael seems like sort of the healthy balance between the two. But as we all know, as the, as the uh, story unfolds, Michael is actually, you know, quite a bit darker and, uh, you know, again, more diabolical than, than Sonny was. He's, it, there's more of a dark strategizing. There's more vengeance. There's more, m- more of a coordinated expression of that aggression. It, it's like Sonny was somehow more innocent, even though he's, <laughs> you know, hurting people. Right. There's, there's something younger and less, less conscious about what was going on in his psyche than in Michael's. And again, the idea is we all have that stuff, but so it, it can be really hard to move through some of these psychotic places in us because when we actually start to bring consciousness and, and actually get a container that starts to hold, it starts to organize, but the sort of the early organization of it is, is dark like that. And that, and that's the nature of the borderline idea that the borderline organization in the psyche, which is the borderline between psychotic and neurotic, it's it, borderline organization involves that black rage, you know, and that, and that feeling of vengeance and that the demonizing, whether it's of self or of other that goes on. And, and it can seem like, again, more, more innocent or more in certain ways, less dangerous than, than when it gets organized up into borderline. And, and clinically it happens that therapists know this, that you can work with a client who, who is exhibiting psychosis and you work and work and work and you, the client improves up into, so to speak, a borderline organization, which is quite an achievement, both by client and by therapist. And then once in the borderline state, it, it's like, well, now it gets much more dangerous for the therapist because now the client gets organized enough to, uh, you know, to actually hate the therapist, which is what... <laughs> to direct it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's that age, you know, the child where the child, you know, the child reaches a certain age to where now when you tell them it's time for bed, they hate you, you know, and, there, and there's a phase where that's supposed to happen. The child's supposed to have their frustration and their anger and their rage about not getting their way, like you just said, be directed at something. And ideally that parent can hold and contain that rage. Ideally, the child does that when the child is too young to run away, and the uh, and and what's hard in a clinical situation is is often the client hits that hits that phase and then does you know end the therapy, and sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's what the client needs to do, and now they need to move on to a different therapist. Or sometimes that same client and therapist can work through that phase. You know, it, it always depends on how how severe is it, how deep is it. Right. That's going on. What what is the actual nature of, of the transferential relationship between the client and the therapist? There's a scale as far as, you know, in the same way as I've said before, there's there's coaching, there's counseling, and then there's psychotherapy. And psychotherapy, and I'm speaking about how it used to be, how that term used to be used, um, it, you know, is about working with unconscious stuff, right? So Psychotherapy is needed when just explaining to someone the right way to be doesn't work, right? But so there's there's levels of unconsciousness as far as you know what are you working with, and and so in certain situations, and we all know this in in our personal relationships and and, and in our own relationship with ourself, you know, we know that there's areas where where we feel psychotic. We know there's areas where we feel borderline. There's areas where we feel neurotic. And so right there, you were being, you were being conscious enough to just feel into, even unprovoked, that feeling of psychotic rage and contact it to, to some degree and share it, meaning allow someone else to be present with you in that experience. 
and obviously that's a lot different situation than if you if you were living from there. Something actually brought it up. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if some if something brought it up, that'd be a deeper level. It'd be deeper still if you just were absolutely, you know, stuck looking through that lens only and believing right. everything that you're experiencing experiencing from there. So what happened? Did we uh in in the in the process of all that did uh I, I became more capable to scheme. I can now scheme better from there. <laughs> that's right. that's, uh, that's right. what I'm now able to do. Probably part of the problem. This is, yeah. this is the last podcast that Jeff's going to be involved. <laughs> Legally. C- could you feel that at all? That, that when there was some containment, that, that with an increase in stability, there also became something a little bit that causes some trepidation about continuing in that direction. Totally. I mean, I think that's like, that happened immediately. Like it's, it's a, uh, it's a good analogy as far as the, the different brothers, different reactions to, uh, to the same circumstances that this uh, rage I'm feeling that to have it contained, like I see it happening. So it's, you know, I got that going for me, but it immediately like went to like a uh, golem like just this dark, nefarious, hidden, yeah, you know, attempting to hide thing. Yeah. But like I said, that felt more stable. Yeah. <laughs> like that was... Uh, a little more agency. Right. Now I feel a little exposed <laughs> for... Uh, it's not going to be a relaxing episode of the Dimension Approach. We'll see what makes it through your editing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it just jumps to the Godfather. <laughs> But it's interesting to, that containment makes a lot more sense. Okay. Because the, the idea of, I think, I think it's each of these, the things are different things we've talked about. The advantage and the danger of them to me has been a valuable insight Mm. that, you know, awakening doesn't mean like everything's better, right? Uh, Healing doesn't mean it's immediately better. It means going back to what, the reason it needed to be healed to begin with. Yeah. Um, containment, as you're describing it, creates a big potential for things to get a lot worse. Having the context of that, that process to me is, is valuable. So that, it, that makes more, more sense to me knowing the risk and the reward or the risk and the technique mm. or the, yeah. there's a, another word around it that happened is there's a taming, right? Mm. Our system and our system will react the same way an animal does, you know, when you attempt to tame it. And the animal always has that instinct; like that doesn't go away. You just uh, forcibly supersede it. Yeah. Over time. So on the on the positive end, if you don't just become Michael Corleone and have everyone killed, <laughs> the <laughs> the container holds and and it shifts from a a hatred of and a frustration with the container and it shifts from a feeling of powerlessness and disappointment that transmutes into a trust of the container, a decrease in a feeling of anxiety. And then within that container, this organic growth and organization happens that to the person's surprise results in a stronger, more capable, more autonomous experience than, than prior. So obviously there's all kinds of movies about this, right? Where the, the, uh, you know, the, whatever, the person with all this talent meets with some kind of coach that is going to put some kind of structure and system on, on their training. And the person with the talent thinks that they're above that or beyond that. But finally the, the student or the athlete or the performer or whatever it is, finally uh, adheres to the the regimen or whatever and then reaches uh, new heights, right? It's, Drumline starring Nick Cannon would be one of my personal favorites. Yeah, Drumline. Drumline, have you ever seen it? No. It's so good. So so one of the things that I did on my end when I shift to shifted to containment is that I... In the beginning, when I was just holding, I was not engaging my will ex- except to tolerate and allow this shitty feeling. 
with you, right? But then I shifted to, it's like I had to get stable in myself if I'm going to provide a stable container for you, which I don't know if you could hear it in my voice or if listeners will have heard it in my voice, but I was aware of an, of an engagement of some kind of forcefulness in order to create stable container. In order to not just react, right? Yeah. In, yeah, in order to not just be moved by you. Yeah, I think that's a relatable, a relatable sentiment. It's like being able to stand outside before you stand with, right? To be able to differentiate yourself and feelings from what's being, uh, in, you know, blown your way. Yeah, a, a way that that can play out in a heated argument kind of stereotypically is the one person's raging and they're just venting and venting and expressing, let's say, uh, in an aggressive way or something. And the other person is, let's say, is is tolerating that and is letting it run and is being on the receiving end of that. But then often, often it's when that person hits their limit they they might start saying, all right, all right, you know, like, okay, that's it. Like, that's enough. Like, I hear you. I get it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, they, they, they started asserting some solid ground and, and putting some boundary and limit on it. Like, all right, that's, right. that's enough now. And it's not saying you're bad or you're wrong or it's not a counter to what you're saying. It's just saying, all right, I got it. I hear you enough right now right you gotta back off a little bit <laughs> point taken my daughter will tell you that my my ears were deaf to her attempts at containment of me no and, and there was some truth to that you know i think any parent probably has to admit that that you're trying to get through to your child in a certain way and the child you know often the the parent doesn't realize that they that the child has reached their capacity for the, the parent thinks you're still not hearing me or you're still not obeying me or you know you're still acting like I'm telling you something that isn't in your own best interest and so let me try to explain it yet again right and, and really the child is just at a point where it's like I can't I can't take anymore I can't hear you know I can't even hear what you're saying I just you coming at me and it's a and it's a really hard situation because the often the parent is trying to do what's best for the child but when the parent's aggression gets mobilized in an attempt to help form the child or teach the child um, again I, often it's like okay the, the child's not ready for that at the moment or is overwhelmed at the moment and there has to be a backing off and and sitting in a space that's that can leave the parent feeling desperately powerless mm relating and growth through those kind of phases it, it it's the nature of of transferential psychotherapeutic work and it can be that the support figure whether it's friend or therapist or teacher or parent or whatever sometimes it's appropriate to sort of aggress at the person because it mobilizes and motivates that person's aggression to come back at the person and there's a phase where that works but obviously if the person if it doesn't work it can just seem like abuse so it's a it's a dicey area and it and it and it you know it falls in line with that idea of the black nightgown and all that stuff. That, that zone between holding and containment and mirroring is a right. dangerous dangerous zone, confusing zones. Which is why being able to remain conscious and to track that. Right. Yeah, again, why you're differentiating the two, holding and containing that you can you can put two people in a room and there's a physical container and you can say that by holding you're helping provide containment but the the act of containing is is something that the the ego would probably avoid if it could the risks of it can be felt in the moment i thought it was interesting too to go back to what you said as far as holding without containment can just lead to increased anxiety i thought that was a really good indicator of when you might be holding and not containing yeah right as far as like learning to differentiate the two and that containing without holding you said was dispassionate holding or was or was it just without compassion i was saying that i was saying that if you contain without holding then it's 
then it's not compassionate, which is not good. Right. But I was saying that's different than dispassionate right. containment, which means trying to be objective or Yeah, right. Providing a container that's still compassionate tends to be a dispassionate container. Right. <laughs> From the person experiencing the container. Yeah. And and another important thing, what often needs to happen is a containment. And then the person pushes against the container aggressively. Ideally, the container holds. And then what often happens is the person who's being contained shifts into a collapse. So it's like they're doing the sunny thing, and then they shift into the Fredo thing. And then ideally, if we say the parent, the parent shifts into providing. It, it, it varies, but, but there's a natural process where, okay, then shift into empathic holding now of that collapse, right? Now, obviously, a person can start doing the collapsing as a defense because we can do anything as a defense. But if we say it's, a, it's, a, it's not a defense, it's a, more of an authentic uh, experience, there, there, there's a back and forth. So the person pushes and rages and mobilizes aggression, and then when that doesn't work to get their way, there's a collapse, and, it, and it's your typical anger and then maybe a shift into sadness or anger and then... It gets contained and then dropping into fear. And obviously, it's not always sadness or fear that's under anger. It can be anger that's underneath sadness or fear, right? It can go any of those ways. But right. Have I <laughs> talked about the the uh, Rocky Three beach scene on, on here before? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so, where uh, he yells at her that he's scared. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, so that, again, that scene, it's a, you know, sounds like such a funny example of it, but... You know, those were powerful movies. And, and, and in that scene, that's what happens is Rocky's in this collapsed Fredo state where he can't get motivated and get aggressive in his training and just kind of despondent. And despite, you know, Apollo yelling at him and, and trying to get him motivated, if that's not working and it doesn't work to go to L.A. and work at Apollo's gym, blah, blah. But finally, Adrian sort of, provides a certain kind of container. And I, I guess the reason I bring it up is, is there's that shift where he finally gets mad and aggresses at her and, and starts, you know, being angry at her. And then she's angry back for a minute and they have a sort of that pushing match. He trusts her enough and, and she's holding enough of a compassionate container to where he drops out of the anger and into the admitting he's scared. And then she immediately shifts and uh, empathizes with that and validates that. And yeah, it's a, it's such a, it's such an important process. You know, these little relational dynamics that, that create these little structural changes in our psyche that, that are these relational transferential, you know, interpersonal experiences. It's not just words. It's not just concepts. It, it, it requires this energetic interaction that is often, you know, very painful and frustrating and confusing. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com.